Chapter 25, Immunization and Vaccines. So we'll go over the different types of immunity that's involved in immunization and vaccinations. <clears throat> the active immunization with the history and the different types, and we'll give some examples uh, with the advantages and disadvantages, limitations of it, and the different factors that will inf uh, influence immunogenicity. What are passive immunization? Some examples of that and benefits and limitations to that and what adoptive immunity is. So remember, last chapter here, what is immunity? It's a condition of being resistant to a disease when we're referring to, you know, disease processes. Um, immunization is a process by which immunity is acquired. I mean, this is a huge topic right now. So there are three different types of immunization. There's active, passive, and adoptive. So what is active immunization? This is where your own immune system is going to do it. And this is usually more in a specific kind of way. So it's dealing with adaptive immune system. So it can happen in one of two ways. Uh, one of them is called natural exposure to the infection. In other words, you get the disease process then you develop antibodies to it, okay? So say um, you get the flu, you didn't get the flu vaccination, so you get the flu, that's your exposure to it, and you will develop antibodies against it. Or the second way is administration of a vaccination. So you can develop the immunity through a vaccination that you get to the particular, we'll use as an example here, the measles virus. So we get a vaccination to it. So it's actually, you know, the virus itself either deactivated or something. And we'll talk about that later. And then you will develop immunity from that. So that's active administrative uh, administration of a vaccine. Passive immunization is where we're transferring the antibodies. In other words, they're already made. Uh, so we don't go through that process of either a vaccination or being exposed to it naturally. So a couple examples of that is the transfer from a mother. From either it can be in utero through the placenta, which would be IgG type, or it could be through the breast milk. So it's a type of secretion. So that would be IgA. So that would be giving the mother's antibodies to the fetus in utero, the placental variety, or in an infant through breast milk. The second way of passive immunization is passive immunotherapy. In other words, these are commercially prepared antibodies. Um, in other words, so you're using pooled amounts of human antibodies for a person. An example, especially with the COVID process going on, is people that had COVID and that have recovered from it. They had gotten their plasma. They pulled their antibodies and gave it to patients that had not uh, had um, developed antibodies to it. So that sort of helped them. So it was not ready-made, so it's passive. It's already prepared, already done kind of antibodies. When you're talking about adoptive immunity, this is transfer of the actual cells. And so we're talking about lymphocytes from somebody that is immunized to a person that is not, so a non-immune individual. So a lot of times we use that in stem cells from in leukemic patients who've gotten, you know, massive amounts of radiation or chemotherapy. We give them stem cells. The stem cells already have the stuff we need uh, to protect the leukemic patient. So that's an example example of adoptive immunity. So what are the advantages and limitations of this? Active immunity gives you a very long-term protection. You know, have a you know short burst of IgM, and then IgG is there for a prolonged period of time. But unfortunately, you got to go through the disease state for you to develop these type of antibodies. Passive, immediate protection. Unfortunately, this is only temporary, and it lasts, you know, a few weeks because there are no memory cells produced anymore. I mean, not anymore at all, not produced at all. And sometimes we can't get hypersensitivity from this. So that's another limitation to it. 
Adoptive immunity is where, you know, you can transfer cell-mediated immunity, so then we can possibly be getting, you know, some graft rejection with that from the, from the allogenic cells, you know, because we're having graft versus host disease kind of process. Um, usually we only give this to people that don't have really a decent immune system, so we're transferring that into them to protect them. So what is a vaccine? Well, a vaccine is usually a suspension of whatever this pathogenic may be. It's the antigen suspension. You know, we got it, whatever the disease thing that we're trying to induce a vaccination with, that's what will be in it. So it's very specific for what we're trying to achieve. So it's going to try to give us active immunity. So once you get the vaccination and you've induced active immunity, hopefully you're going to prevent the disease in the healthy individual. So it's a type of prophylactic, now before they get it, an immune prophylactic, before they get exposure to it. So we have antibodies to it. So that on the second exposure, within 24 hours, they have antibody production being made. Now, how did all this start? Well, in ancient China, uh, they had what's called virulation, was performed to protect against smallpox. Uh, that happened actually before Jenner did this. So Edward Jenner in 1796 found out, you know, the maidens milking the cows had cowpox on their hands and stuff. So he got those lesions because he noticed that they did not get smallpox. So what he did is he got the cowpox from the lesions and then he would scratch it onto the surface of the people and that would give them protection against smallpox. So that was a true first vaccination that we actually had. Now, in the 1880s, Louis Pasteur, you know, he found out that we could attenuate, in other words, weaken the organism so he could develop vaccines against stuff that was very lethal. I mean, you couldn't give them like cowpox. You couldn't do that. So he would develop vaccinations where it was an attenuated organism, like rabies was one, anthrax, uh, cholera, that kind of stuff. I mean, that was very fatal in those years. But attenuation, you know, is weaken the bacterial virus. It's either they can do it by growing it at different temperatures, so it isn't pathogenic, it's not virulent anymore. Uh, they can give it some kind of chemicals, or they can grow it in cell culture. So there's me many methods on trying to attenuate, you know, a bacterial virus so we can use it as a vaccination. Now, in the 20th century, that's where vaccinations really told we did a lot. So they got a lot of different types of organisms um, for trying to attenuate, like TB and typhoid was one of the big ones out there. They developed toxoids. In other words, they got inactivated bacterial toxins to diphtheria and tetanus. So that would protect people that had been exposed to it. So from the toxins of the diphtheria and the tetanus, we could actually protect that. It's the toxin from those, not the actual bacteria is what is so lethal. We had attenuated viral vaccinations, measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, polio. Um, we produce um, glycoconjugates. In other words, they're purified bacteria polysaccharides that are linked to a certain type of protein. Is another type of vaccination they did. And then we had the first recombinant genetically engineered vaccination. And that was the first one that was actually done was hepatitis B. In other words, we genetically engineered it it to work for us. So beyond that, you know, there has been all kinds of vaccinations that are out there. And as you can see right now, we're really working on very strong for COVID-19. But there are, you know, a lot of attenuated vaccines out there, the flu, the herpes zoster, all that's out there. We do have what's called multivalent glycoconjugates like pneumococcal, like you've heard the Prevnar, so it protects against 13 different varieties of it. Um, and then the meningococcus is another one, uh, another recombinant vaccination that we have to prevent uh, HPV, you know, what can cause cervical cancer is out there. And there's all kinds of new technologies that are out there, which, you know, are actively being pursued right now. So normally in a conventional vaccination, we basically always use the whole organism because that gives actually the best response, you know, so we have a better chance of getting true immunity 
developing antibodies to it. So with the whole, whole organism, we can attenuate it or we can act, inactivate it. In other words, kill it. Usually attenuate is a little bit better, uh, but you got that risk of somebody could possibly get something from it. You know, it depends on each person. Inactivated has killed it completely, but again, sometimes you don't get a real strong immune response from that. Or you can get a part of the organism, like we talked about the toxoids. So the toxins coming off of it, you know, that's just a byproduct of the organism itself, and we're developing antibodies to it. You can get uh, glycoconjugates, in other words, polysaccharides of the organism, or you can use just purified or recombinant proteins, you know, different parts of the organism to develop the vaccination. So attenuated vaccines, you know, are usually live, but like we said, they're very weakened. You know, it can be a viral bacteria. So we grow them, you know, under not normal conditions that they like, so they're abnormal. So they aren't considered pathogenic disease producing. They aren't able to be virulent, to cause problems. But they are very capable of still eliciting an immune response, which is what we want. One of the examples of a live attenuated vaccine is called BCG, Bacillus calmet guerrerin, which is normally used for TB. Um, in other words, it's an actual bacteria. It actually promotes a T cell response, a cell mediated response. Works extremely well. One for Salmonella typhi. It's actually a mutated strain, you know, which is, causes typhoid fever. So it works really well. The polio made by Sabin, um, there was three polio virus genotypes, and at that one time it was given orally. And what happens is each unique gene can be identified by a serological type. That's why they came up with three different ones. It used to be given on a sugar cube years ago. Influenza, they do have what's called a nasal mist now. Uh, they can spray into your nose. Uh, the t couple different strains of influenza A and influenza B for you to develop an immune response. Other examples of live attenuated vaccinations when you're talking about viruses is rubiola, which is measles, rubella, which is German measles, the mumps, and varicella, which can be chicken pox or it can be shingles, which they are two actually separate types of vaccinations there. So what are the advantages and limitations of live and attenuated vaccinations. So depending on what it is, they can stimulate both humoral and cell mediated. Sometimes, you know, it's just cell mediated, but they can stimulate both. Um, you cannot give to somebody that's immunocompromised live and attenuated vaccinations. They have to be tro totally inactivated because of their immunocompromise. They might actually get sick. I mean, that's one of the questions that's supposed to be asked. Now, you do not give vaccinations to people that are ill or have immunodeficient problems. It's a different type of vaccination you have to give. Now, sometimes this can cause interference with um, the passive immunity from the mother, the maternal antibodies. Um, live and attenuated vaccines, of course, they're live, so it has particular storage and handling requirements that we have to follow. And like it says here, on rare occasion, it can revert to a pathogenic form. So, you know, that's why it is monitored extremely carefully, careful to make sure we don't have this problem. Inactivated vaccines means they either get the virus or the bacteria and they've actually killed it. And usually, you know, heat is one of the biggest things that they give or chemicals. Uh, some examples of the inactivated vaccines, which was made by Salk, was the IM polio, intramuscular polio, um, the IM shot for influenza, and hepatitis A. That was some of the inactivated vaccines that was given. So, again, so what's the advantages and the limitations of inactivated vaccinations? Now, you can give this to immunocompromised individuals, you know, because it's not nothing live or nothing weakened or nothing. So this will stimulate the humoral immunity, but not really the cell-mediated immunity. Now, unfortunately, with the inactivated vaccinations, you might need to give what's called booster shots. In other words, more than one shot has to be given to make sure we get enough exposure, you know, of whatever this inactivated thing is 
to make sure that we produce immunity to the person. Some subunit vaccinations, in other words, these are purified components of that. Uh, toxoids, like we said, that's a component. Polysaccharides, purified proteins, or recombinant proteins. So these are purified parts of a pathogen. So it's not the whole thing, it's just a part of it. That's why it's considered a subunit. Now, when we talk about toxoids, remember this is something that is actually liberated by the virus or the bacteria. Okay, and diphtheria um, and tetanus both have that. So what they do is they chemically inactivate the bacterial toxins so they're not pathogenic, but they are still able to elicit an immune response. So they work extremely well. Okay, polysaccharides, so these are purified polysaccharides, and it's usually from the capsule that's around a bacteria. So you can see a couple of examples there, strep pneumo, and you can see it's got a lot of different type of serotypes of that. That's that Prevnar thing that we were talking about. The vaccination Hib, which is for inf Haemophilus influenza type B, and then Neisseria meningitidis. So these actually require a conjugation to a carrier because they're so small. Because we want to remember, make it more immunogenic. So what they do is they bind a protein to it. So a lot of times when you get the shot, they're like, are you allergic to yeast or eggs or something, that kind of stuff. So they require a conjugate to it. So this carrier protein, you know, with the um, purified polysaccharide will induce an IgG production, which will give us a long-term type of immunity. A uh, purified protein um, is a component, again, of a microorganism like whooping cough, uh, which is Bordetella pertussis, uh, because it's got two or five different proteins that they'll use in that one. And it includes the actual toxoid to it. That's why, you know, that was a big deal for us to get that uh, Tdap out to make sure everybody got that uh, vaccination. Recombinant proteins, these are proteins produced by genetically modified non-pathogenic bacteria, yeast, or other cells. So like hepatitis B, they actually grew it in a type of yeast for some others. It was certain bacteria. So they had the hepatitis B surface antigen in it, and then we actually developed an antibody to it. That's what the Heptavax is all about. The human papilloma virus is actually the L1 protein. Um, and you'll develop antibodies against that. So recombinant proteins, they can't be used to produce antigens other than the proteins they already are. So it's just they're being made through different things. You know, like we inject the genes into the yeast, and the yeast grows that particular type of antigen. So then we can infect, you know, not infect, uh, vaccinate people with it. So what are the advantages of subunit vaccinations? No, so... Instead of actually giving the whole organism, we're just giving the parts that's considered pathogenic so we can induce an immune response on that part. So it avoids, you know, giving them, you know, like, you don't want to give somebody uh, tetanus. You'd rather give them the an antibody production to the toxin, which is the, the toxin that comes off of the tetanus. That's what we're after. So some limitations of it. Uh, sometimes you need extra shot. I mean, that like the tetanus, you need it every 10 years to make sure you produce protective immunity. A lot of them do require, you know, being bound to a protein, some adjuvant to it. So it's more immunogenic for it. Some of them have to be multiple serotypes. So it's multivalent. So it can produce a real broad immune response. So it all depends on what you're after as to what you want to give. So what are the actual factors that affect immunogenicity? Um, you can see that there's a schedule there, and it's actually in your book. You know, I don't know how up to date it is, but 462 and 463 can actually show you that. But if you go to that website, that will actually give you the vaccination schedule that should be done uh, for a child, adolescent, and for adult. They each have their own particular one. But so the age is a huge thing when we're talking about vaccinations, you know, to develop the correct immunogenicity of stuff that we need to do.
So you really want to start with the youngest individual first to make sure that the person, you know, can develop an immune response to it so that we can actually protect people against it. But it's got to be safe. So it's got to be appropriate for the particular age group that we're dealing with. All right. So if you go look on that Center for Disease Control, you will actually see on there the schedule of how it should be given. Um, so when you go to a pediatrician, they have a schedule that you always follow. And you hear it on TV all the time about vaccinations. Other things uh, that affect immunogenicity is the immune status of the person. I mean, are, is a person immunocompetent? In other words, can they elicit an immune response? Are they in the correct age? Because remember, too young doesn't work, too old doesn't work that well. So we have to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of factors. I mean, are they on chemotherapy? Are they on immunosuppressants? Have they had a transplant? You know, are they sick from something else right now? You know, there's a lot of things that affect it. So the degree of host immunocompetence, you know, is huge. You know, we've got to really be careful when we're giving vaccinations to that. The other thing that can affect it, the third thing, is the composition of the vaccine. Is it a subunit? You know, which, you know, we can, remember we were talking about the different types, parts of, um, of a bacteria va virus that we can give. They don't seem to work as well, but, you know, sometimes that's all we can do. So it's, something is better than nothing. And then being a live and attenuated vaccine. They seem to be the best that we have out there. Um, and that's usually what's given a majority of the time. So adjuvants, so adjuvants are stuff that we mix with the vaccination that help us enhance a better immune response. So it will actually stimulate the innate immune system. I'm sure everybody's gotten a shot in your arm and you know how it gets sore. Sometimes it gets red. Sometimes you get a little fever, uh, you get tired, achy. Uh, that's actually stuff a lot of times that they have in the vaccination to induce the innate system to release cytokines to actually activate the adaptive system a lot better. So it's a more effective vaccination that you can get. So, you know, the delivery of the antigen to the B cells, to the, you know, adaptive system is very important, you know, because you got to have the correct, you know, there's a whole procedure, as you remember, that we have to go through to enhance how the antigens are exposed. You know, we have to have antigen presenting cells. They have to go through the monocytes, the segs, and go to the T cells, it goes to the B cells. B cells got to transform into plasma cells. So there is a huge amount that is involved, you know, in this antigen delivery system. Also, immunopotentiators. In other words, they have to activate the other antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells. So the dendritic cells will then present the antigen to the T cells. Remember, there's a lot of parts to getting the entire immune system to work. The innate, then you talk about the adaptive, so you're talking about cell-mediated and humoral. So adjuvants, remember, these are something you know, that we can add. Uh, it's like co-administer with a vaccine to make sure we enhance our immune system. So a couple examples of this are alum which is like an aluminum kind of thing or there's oil and water emulsions are called Freund's complete and incomplete adjuvant it's just a name for like a conglomeration a mixture of stuff they can get so this results in a better immune response um so it sort of drags it out it's like it likes like it picks it up and takes away real quick so it makes big involvement of the antigen presenting cells, big involvement of the whole adaptive immune system. You know, so it'll make increase in antibody production. It will make the cell mated immunity really do a lot, you know, because, you know, having these adjuvants a lot of times, you don't need to give as much of the antigen in the vaccination. You might not need to give, you know, boosters so it can make it lag longer, stay longer in the area so we get a elicit a better immune response. So what are the next-gen vaccinations? I mean, we're working on those huge right now. Um, 
So they can identify potent vaccination antigens by pure molecular methods now. Now we can, you know, doing PCR, DNA analysis, RNA analysis, figure out what's going on. Um, that's what they're working on now. Reverse vaccinology. Uh, screening the entire genome of a pathogen. In other words, they we actually broke the COVID down so we could identify the genes that are in it so that we could determine what is a better vaccination that will work better. Other ways we can do it is, remember, we can induce antibodies that can neutralize different toxins, can neutralize the antigen process. Um, we found that there's better adjuvants out there, things that work better to make it more immunogenic, uh, different ways to get vaccinations. I mean, the nasal spray, I mean, years ago, we never had that. Um, different ways for us to assess how the immunity is working. Other than, you know, just doing antigen antibody titers, um, we can actually look to see, you know, what immunity is coming out, which antibody it is, what you know, subtype of antibody it is. Does it work? Is it specific? I mean, there's a lot of things that are necessary for us to figure out for it to work better. So what are the benefits of a vaccination? Well, you know, that has really protected populations of people enormously in some areas where you see there is no vaccinations you know you can see rampant disease and stuff occurs so with vaccinations we have i wouldn't say totally eradicated but in some things like smallpox a huge amount so we've really reduced a lot of fatal diseases out there now so now you know the morbidity and mortality is is much better than what it used to be is it perfect? No, probably never will. I mean, viruses and bacteria have learned to adapt and change, and new things are constantly coming. So we have to be on the, you know, actively searching to determine what needs to be done. Okay, so what is community, or they also call it herd immunity? This is protection extended to people nearby who didn't get the vaccination by people who did get the vaccination. In other words, say you got 100 people and 70% of them got the flu vaccination. Well, the other 30% are probably protected because the virus, you know, it probably will be stopped in that 70%. So say you get the other 100%, 100 people again, and only 10% got it. Well, then you got a better chance of people, you know, getting the flu because not as many people are immunized against it. So that's what herd immunity is. We don't know if it works with the COVID yet. I mean, it's still too early to determine what, what that is. So here's, you know, just showing you the benefits uh, in a graphical presentation of looking at the immunity. So the blue up here is not immunized, but they're still healthy. The green means they're immunized and they're healthy. And the red are not immunized, they're sick and contagious. So in the first one up here, you can see there's a couple people in here that are sick. But most of them are non-immunized. Mm. Most of them are non-immunized up here. So no one is immunized. Contagious disease spreads throughout the population. Okay, if we look in the second picture here, some of the uh, population has been immunized. So... It's contagious disease spreads through some of the population. So if we look at the bottom one, you can see most of the population is immunized here. So now the spread isn't, you know, as bad as it was from the previous ones. So that's the benefits of a vaccination. They work extremely well. Are there adverse effects? Yeah, sure there is. Um, the local reactions is red, swells, puffy. I mean, we probably all had that. Some generalized reactions, you know, do run a low-grade fever, you ache, you're tired. Um, usually, severe reactions are not that common. Uh, so we can't get allergic reactions, type 1 and type 3, hypersensitivity can occur. So what are the chances of developing a disease? I mean, depends on who you talk to, but in general, when a live attenuated vaccine is given to somebody immunocompromised, yeah, the chance is there. That's why we have to screen patients carefully before we actually give vaccinations to make sure 
that the person isn't immunocompromised. That way we're actually giving it to people that they're not sick, you know, they have a decent immune system. Because, you know, a live attenuated is exactly what it is. It is live. That's why you have to change to a different type of vaccination to protect the person. So getting back to passive immunity, remember this is transfer of antibodies that have already been made to a person who who has not had antibodies made. They're unimmunized, as they call it. Now, this can be done naturally through the mother, breast milk, or through the placenta, or it can be administered, you know, like in IV drugs through administration of therapeutic agents. You know, we actually give it. IVIG is one of the big things that we actually give a lot of times, intravenous immunoglobulins. So passive immunity, like we said, natural, you know, mother, fetus, or infants. So that's IgG through the placenta and IgA through the breast milk, because remember that is actually a secretion. And see, it's no IgM, just IgG and IgA. We can give standard human immune serum globulin, also called IVIG. Uh, also known as gamma globulins, so it can be given, you know, in a shot or IV drugs. So it's usually made from thousands of donors that have been screened very carefully. So it contains antibodies to multiple things. Uh, so that's given to people that really don't have decent antibody production. So we give them some kind of some protection. Again, it's you know it's done last long. It's only for a few weeks, months or so. So you have to be careful with that. There are specific human serum globulins that you can give uh, to specific uh, particular pathogens. Some of those out there are hepatitis A and hepatitis B, varicella, rabies, tetanus, and RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, so we use that to treat people that don't have immunity to it, you know, that could possibly get exposed. I mean, that's what they were trying with the COVID-19 right now to see if that will work. Other things that we have out there is we have antitoxins. Uh, usually it's prepared from horse serum, a lot of, you know, equine stuff. Uh, so they can have antitoxins to tetanus, antitoxins to diphtheria, botulism. You know, like the anti-snake venoms, you know, anti-rattlesnake. They got um, anti-black widow. We got all kinds of anti-venoms. And what that does is it neutralizes the toxins so it doesn't really hurt us. That's the advantages to it. But you got to know exactly what you're dealing with. So passive immunity, um, another big thing is called monoclonal antibodies. Okay, so monoclonal antibodies are made from a single clone of a B cell, whereas opposed to polyclonal is multiple clones of a B cell. So the monoclonal antibody is directed against a particular epitope of a particular antigen. Okay, and we can use those to treat cancers, uh, autoimmune diseases, and a whole bunch of other diseases. Just watch on TV. I mean, you will see it. Anything with MAB means monoclonal antibody. So if it has O, MAB means it came from a mouse. XI, MAB means it's chimeric. As you can see, it's multiple things we're dealing with. Human eyes, so we got it from a human friend, or it's Z-U-M-A-B and U-M-A-B. So you can tell from the, you know, real name of it, not the product name of it, the real name, you can determine what the monoclonal antibody is. Again, this is a passive thing, ready-made antibodies that are given to somebody to treat multiple things. You can see it on TV all the time. So benefits of it, it gives us immediate immunity. We don't have to go through, you know, days, weeks, for us to develop antibodies now. So with this, you know, this will provide immediate, immediate immunity. So say you stepped on a rusty nail and you, I don't know, I don't know when the last time I got my tetanus vaccination. So what they'll do is they'll give you the tetanus vaccination. So you'll develop it antibodies eventually, but they give you, you know, a uh, antitoxin, a toxoid that will protect you against the toxin of the tetanus itself. So it can be done that way. Also, also, other things for passive immunity that can be done is for immunosuppressive therapy in selected situations. You know, for instance, an RH mother gives birth to an RH positive baby. 
and used to prevent hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn in the future births. So what they've done is they give the mother uh, anti-RH, and what that will do is if there's any fetal cells in there, it will actually cover those RH-positive fetal cells so that now the mother's body cannot see them as foreign and will not develop antibodies against it. So it's a type of immunosuppressive therapy that can come out. So limitations of passive immunity. Again, it, it doesn't last that long, you know, three or four weeks, maybe a month. Um, and also it can induce type 1 and type 3 hypersensitivity. In other words, you know, like you develop antibodies against the uh, equine part of it, you know. So that can happen. So there are some limitations to it. And again, you have to weigh the odds, you know, which is way, you know, the different scenarios. Do you have to give passive and give stuff to produce active? You know, so it depends on what's going on as to, you know, what you give and what order. So adoptive immunity, this is when we uh, talked about the stem cell stuff. So we're actually transferring cells of the immune system into a patient. And that will, you know, increase cell-mediated immunity, you know, because it's T-cell kind of stuff, which is a big thing they're using for uh, pancreatic cancer right now. Um, so what they do is they get two more infiltrating lymphocytes. They actually get the T-cells out of the patient a lot of times. They then activate them. So they will target the cancer cells, and then they introduce those back into the patient. So that's a trying to cancer treatment uh, that's out right now. Another one is stem cell transplants into people that are have immunodeficient issues. So they get immunocompetent, you know, stem cells that can make B cells and T cells. So they will have developed some immunity. It won't be perfect, but it'll be better than nothing. So in summary, uh, active immunization is when the person's own immune system does its thing. You know, we get exposure to the antigen. We go through the whole process of antigen presentation. You know, so we go for APC cells, T cells, B cells, plasma cells, antibody production. Remember, there's primary and secondary immune response. Examples of active immunity include natural infection. You know, you actually get the thing, you get flu, then you develop antibodies to it. Or you can get a vaccination, and that will let you go through that primary immune response. So if you get exposed to it again, you got antibodies there, you're good to go. Passive immunity is when we're transferring antibodies, you know, that have already been made from something else to the patient. You know, an example that we use a lot of times for passive immunity would be the mother giving it to the fetus, you know, in utero through the placenta or in breast milk. Uh, giving it to the infant at that time. You can also also have commercially prepared antibody preparations that can be done too. So active immunity takes longer, but it gives us a longer-term memory. Passive is extremely short-lived. Remember, we said about a month or so. Active can last maybe up to 10 years. So a huge difference between the two. Adoptive immunity is when we're transferring cells of the immune system from one host to a person who doesn't have an immune system, such as stem cells, transplants. All right, so that's the end of Chapter 25. If you look on, in Chapter 25 on page 471, 472, and 473, you'll see a study guide and, of course, the review questions in the back. Uh, make sure you look at the PowerPoint that has to deal with the test review. If you run into any questions or concerns, make sure you contact me. Thank you.